Hello, and welcome to another episode of Caregiver Stories Podcast, where we discuss all things dementia and hopefully share some caregiver stories along the way. My name is Kimberly Scott. I am a part-time caregiver to my mother, who at age 65 was diagnosed with early onset dementia. And in 2019, I started Caregiver Stories Podcast to help build awareness and educate others on dementia. As well as the most important thing I want this podcast to do is spread awareness and get people talking about the what if your loved one can no longer care for themselves. Then what? What's the plan? If you want to share your story or if you have knowledge on dementia and want to be a guest on Caregiver Stories podcast, please go to thatkimberly.com to sign up to be a guest. And you can also listen to other episodes, choose the platform you wish to listen to the podcast on while you're there. And now that we got that out of the way, my guest today is Lisa B. Cap. Hello, Lisa. Hello, Kimberly. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. I appreciate you joining me today and sharing your story. You having me. Thank awesome. You. Well, give the listeners a little bit of background about who you are and what led you to do the work you do with dementia. Absolutely. So when I introduce myself, I tell people I'm a writer, an activist, and a dementia caregiving survivor. Mm. I shared a journey through dementia of 18 years with my mom, Vera, who passed away in 2015. I'm sorry. Thank you. Those 18 years began with my mom moving in with my husband and I after my dad passed away. So half of the journey was spent living with us as her disease manifest and progressed. And then the last half of her journey, nine years, was in full memory care. Wow. I, at the time, was working for a Fortune 100 company as an international consultant in high tech. And I was traveling the world and trying to manage caregiving. Mm. My husband playing boots on the ground through a lot of that. So I really believe now I've retired and as a former family caregiver, I am giving back. I am spending time with folks like you Mm -hmm. who are doing awesome things in this community, helping others to understand. And yeah, thank you. I know what it feels like to have to travel and be everything to everyone at the same time, because that's what happened when my mom was diagnosed. It was juggling my life and her life at the same time and trying to figure it out was very difficult for sure. I think your generation, this generation of caregivers for, especially as in your case with your mom, a young onset diagnosis is emotionally much more complicated. And so my heart goes out to you and what you're dealing with, likely at the peak of your career and long-term caregiving. That's a lot. Yeah, it is. It's a lot. Thank you very much. Those words very sweet. Everybody's journey is difficult. Some of the stories I've heard with some people having children right when it's happening to them because they're so young and they don't want to leave whether it's their parent or their grandparent alone and they want to figure that out. It is hard no matter what stage it happens. And I commend every caregiver that takes that on and still tries to pursue their lives and their careers at the same time because it's difficult. Like you said, survivor of, because some people don't survive caregiving. I did not realize that until I really got into the throes and started meeting more people and decided to do this podcast about the caregivers. I think what you just said, Kimberly, is critically important for other people to understand. Dementia is going to affect all of us in one way or another, whether It's ourselves being diagnosed and trying to live well with this very difficult disease, or whether it's being in a caregiver space for someone you love, and across any generation, whether it's grandparents, whether it's parents, whether it's spouses and partners, friends and family. So what you're doing and others in this space to build awareness, Mm -hmm. for people to understand how very difficult this disease is, is critically important. Absolutely. And that we are living longer and there is going to be a shortage of caregivers because- (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And so if we're not talking about it and preparing 
for it. I say preparing because, you know, I believe that you can prepare all you want and have a plan, but then God, the universe, you know, has another plan for you, you know, that's probably better than what you ever anticipated. However, to at least have a conversation was the biggest, especially because my mom was very much the person who ran the household. She was the go-getter. Our personalities are very similar. So I know that if we had had just even a 30-minute conversation about these things, the first two years of when she was diagnosed, I wouldn't have been guessing. And that's what I was doing. I was trying to figure it out as I went. And it's just the most traumatic thing that anyone can be put through, not on purpose, obviously, but by accident. And so good for you for doing what you're doing as well to bring awareness to it, to this disease that more people need to be discussing, having a conversation. And and just in the past, since I started this podcast in the beginning of 2019, have I figured out that dementia is a symptom of over a hundred something you know, cognitive diseases. I did not understand that in the beginning. If you think about it, dementia is the umbrella. Yes. I've written some articles about this. When people say, I've been diagnosed with this, but at least I don't have dementia. Dementia is the overarching disease Mm -hmm. that Alzheimer's and Lewy body and vascular dementia all fit under. And we have to understand them. There's two parties in this disease that are critically important. There's a person diagnosed and living with, and some people undiagnosed and living with. Yeah. And then there's the caregiver. And I'm really focused in my work today on the caregivers Mm -hmm. because right now, finally, a lot of money is going to research. I'm very hopeful Mm -hmm. uh, for the first time in my life with this disease that we may be able to find better early detection, better treatment, and maybe ultimately a cure. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's a wonderful space. I wish it were faster. I wish we could get answers now. Yeah. Uh, But the caregivers, as you said, a lot of caregivers don't survive. A lot of caregivers come into this and just want to do the best for their loved ones. And my husband and I did exactly the same thing. Yeah. Out of care and love and support for my mom, we let her dementia go to crisis. And my goal in working with caregivers these days is to help them because everyone in this disease will have a different experience. Absolutely. No experience is like any other for yep. either party. And so the goal I have is to help caregivers recognize they have superpowers uh, Mm -hmm. to do what caregivers do today. And you know, you know, from your work, right? If we Mm -hmm. were to write the job description of unpaid family caregiver, (laughs) put it out on Indeed or any of those sites, no one would apply. (laughs) It's beyond what people understand. And so my hope is to empower caregivers to change some of their thinking. Yeah. Because in the moment, in the crisis of caregiving, you deal with it. Yeah. But there are so many things we can think about and try to help each other to change. Yeah. How was your mom diagnosed? Was it clinically diagnosed or did you just signs occurred and, you know, one day everybody came together and said, something's wrong. What happened? My mom was spending most of the year with us in Vermont, but... (laughs) We had a house in Arizona that she'd come out to and spend the harsh parts of the winter. Mm -hmm. And she was driving, she was independent, and she started to get lost. Mm. So she took herself to the doctor, and the doctor gave her a box of Namenda medications, which at that time were the popular. um, Yeah, my mom takes it. Yeah. And told her he thought she was beginning to experience dementia. She went home to the place in Arizona, packed away the box of meds. And three months later, when she got back to Vermont, showed them to me and asked, do you think I'm losing my mind? Uh. So then we started to get her into, actually in Vermont, we had a geriatric psychiatrist that we worked with that was outstanding. Mm -hmm. Although she was never at that time, you weren't diagnosed. Because at that time, the only diagnosis was postmortem. 
Mm. So they said, well, yeah, you've got pretty clear signs of cognitive impairment, but my mom's dementia manifests, like we said, all of them manifest differently. Yeah. Those manifest with really terrifying, horrible delusions and hallucinations early in her progression. Wow. So we actually, the hardest part of her illness was while we were trying to work with it, with her living at home, it became so bad that the only choice I had was to involuntarily commit my mom. Yeah. To the psych ward. And they were able to balance antipsychotic medications with her dementia meds. But the doctors intervened in the psych ward and made it very clear to us she couldn't go back home to live. So mm-hmm. she went right from there into full memory care. Yeah. And I'm sure that was very tough on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You and her at the same time. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. What advice would you give to someone who just discovered that their loved one is diagnosed and is going to have to become a caregiver? The hardest part about that part, right? There are, there's a continuum a caregiver goes through. And the hardest part, there are two, to me, there are two ridiculously hard parts. There is sensing something's wrong and figuring out what you're going to do about it. Mm -hmm. That's a denial phase. Yeah. The second part is the diagnosis because unfortunately today there's so much stigma around this disease. Yeah. It is plain and simple, a brain disease. It has very specific reasons why it's happening that are beyond the control of anyone. Mm-hmm. It's so never coming back. Your memory is coming, coming back. back. Yeah. Once you lose that, it's never coming back. Mm-hmm. And today it's fatal. So mm-hmm. when you get a diagnosis, the individual diagnosed and having to live with the illness is facing a whole set of complications while the caregiver is unsure what to do. Yeah. They're, <laughs> so, they're just as confused and frightened as the caregiver. So the only advice I can give people at that stage, because their inclination is to be silent. Mm-hmm. Their inclination is to tell no one. Yeah, and it's bad. To change that. Yeah. Their inclination should be to reach out as much as possible because people don't know how to help those who have been diagnosed. Yeah. And we need to teach them. Getting information, getting connected, knowing there are resources are the most important parts. And unfortunately, so many people today at that point of diagnosis lock the doors, close the curtains, and say, I just want it to stay like it is because I know it's going to get worse. Yeah. Awareness and conversations. I was in the Houston airport last week, and there was a woman that I happened to notice was older and walking around with her son. At the time, far away, it looked like It was someone that was related to her, not her husband. And they got separated. And I just happened to look up and see that. And she just had this lost look. And I walked up to her because I was sitting down eating and walked up to her and was like, ma'am, you know, are you looking for someone? He's over here. Because she was on the complete opposite side of this. Like there was a kiosk right in front where she couldn't see that he had gone to the right side of wherever the gate was. And she just had that lost look of confusion and then wasn't quite sure she trusted me because I, you know, I put my hand on her back and was trying to lead her. But then she was like, I'm a little confused. I'm with my son. And, and he said that my husband's died and it's very embarrassing. I have to tell you that, but yeah, I'm not quite sure. It's like, no worries. You know, I, let's walk this way. Cause I'm pretty sure he's over here. And then like, I'm waving at the sun because everybody else is just walking by her. I feel if people have never seen or been around someone with dementia that you don't recognize the look in their eyes and the fear in their face that they are truly lost and confused at that moment, you know? So as soon as she saw him, she was fine, but you know, I'm very much more aware now than I was ever before because of my mom. And yeah, it was quite a eye-opening experience. (laughs) But it must have been such a relief for both her and for her son. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Her son was like, thank you. I was like, no, my mom, you know, she definitely gets lost in the airport like that kind of, he's like, oh, same thing, huh? We got to get them walkie talkies, don't we? Like joking around. And I was like, no, you just need to hold. I felt like telling him you need to hold her hand, but I didn't want to be judgmental. But at the moment in time, I, you know, cause I, I have to be patient with others and I don't want people judging me how, what I do for my mom or not do in their eyes. And so I just, at that moment, checked myself with, don't judge him because yeah. I don't want to be judged, you know, yeah, and, but it was a um, learned lesson for sure. <laughs> well, but that should be what we're all doing, right? Yeah. Public yeah. spaces and helping, but you hit on it. You had a recognition. You noticed yeah. what she was saying without words. Yeah. It's critically important. Yeah. I, always ask one thing, what would you want people to know when it comes to dementia? I want people to know, I had a phone call with a colleague yesterday who is living well with dementia. He's mm -hmm. just an amazing man, young onset like your mom, Kim, mm -hmm. and he's an advocate beyond what I can imagine. And he's fighting hard for people to know that when it comes to dementia, they need to know that you can live well with dementia. Mm -hmm. That yes, the later stages of dementia, which is all that's in the media right now, mm -hmm. are not the early stages. Yeah. Granted, everybody's dementia is different, mm -hmm. but we know right now of the 5.8 million Americans diagnosed with dementia, over 200,000 of them are young onset, which wow. means younger than age 65. Mm. as young as 40. Ah. So that look you recognized in that woman's eyes, although she was an older person, we're going to see that look everywhere and yep. age isn't going to be a factor. Yep. So I think we, what I want people to understand is for caregivers, there's a continuum of care. For those living with, there is a continuum of the experience and it's not end stage. Ultimately, it is today, unfortunately, but there's a lot of life in the disease, like so many diseases. Mm -hmm. That's what I want people to know. Yeah. Don't just automatically assume that they can't do the regular things. And at the same time, some of the regular things that you know they absolutely can't do because they're shown you that they yeah. can't do yeah. because that was a debate I got into with my brother when he's like, you can't just take things away from her. I was like, I'm not, but she can't find her car when she comes out of the grocery store. You know, yeah. you know, she loses her cell phone for a long time. I would track her with her cell phone. And then because she lives in El Paso and she plays tennis four times a week, the doctor said, keep her active like that. Cause that's, what's keeping her body going. Yeah. She started driving into Mexico because Instead of taking a right to where the tennis court was, El Paso's on the border, she would take the bridge to Mexico. And the second time she did it, we're like, okay, got to go to the doctor. The doctor has to say, you cannot drive. You know, like that's just too many times. It, it's about safety. You know, yeah, safety. And early on, her finances were very, you know, messed up. So she was very happy to have me help her to get them organized. And a friend of hers said they usually are willing to give up things that give them their own angst and stress. And driving is usually the last one because that's their independence. But your mom seemed to be very happy that you were good with making sure her bills got paid on time, you know, mm -hmm. and, and things of that sort. So I did get those sense of feelings and reassuring that what I did take off her plate was good, but like other things, you know, from going to the grocery store with someone she wants to do, you know, washing her own dishes she wants to do. Like there are things that they still want to do and letting them do those things that are safe, not cooking. She doesn't cook anymore because she has a caregiver now during the day that we found that enjoys spending time with her and, and is funny and fun and gets out with her because she's still very physically healthy. So that's the part, isn't it? Yeah. That's the hard part. But all of this comes from Kimberly your ability to talk with her, your ability to continue to try to understand her needs, what she's capable of, yeah, and your ability to say, okay, now it's time to go to the doctor because I don't think you can do that. Anymore. Yeah, yeah. And it's the mother-daughter relationship where she was the parent telling me what to do. I have figured out that I can nicely suggest what's best, but it has to come from a medical professional for her to listen. Otherwise, she won't. 
because it's still the mother daughter dynamic that is hard with her and I for her to accept things that she should no longer be doing, you know, just out of mere safety. So Kimberly, we're putting a, there's a national caregiving conference in Chicago every year in the fall. Oh, really? I've been a part of it for the last three years. And one of the presentations I'm sharing the stage with another colleague on is called Complicated Journeys Through Care. Mm. And when daughters become caregivers for mothers, there is often a complicated journey there. Yes, (laughs) yes. And because my relationship with my mom beforehand was good, like my mom is one of the strongest people I know. She taught me my work ethic. Like she was the best mother I could have ever, you know, prayed for, wished for. And I know it's my duty to now make sure that she's comfortable. I learned from her because she, she took care of her father and mother. Mm -hmm. You know, that was the thing that I had no problem doing, but, but yet at the same time, because I don't want her to be mad and angry at me all the time. I don't want to ruin the relationship. I don't want it to affect how she feels about me right? or I feel about her in the end, you know? And so that's what I've been trying to do my best and be very aware of because in the first two years we were constantly fighting about stuff that just, I realized she couldn't help herself. You know, it's not her, it's not really her. So when you said it's in Chicago and do you have a date set? Yeah. What I can do is make sure I get to you the information Okay. For your listeners. Yeah. Because it is offered both in person and the main stage speakers are also offered virtually. Okay. The registration for virtual is free. Okay. Caregivers often can't get away. What is something that surprised you from being a caregiver about yourself that you didn't realize that you had in you, I guess? <laughs> you know, it's so interesting. What I have to compare is my work life to my caregiving life. I Mm -hmm. wasn't in the health field. I didn't have caregiving in my background. I was thrust into it as so many are in these situations. And what I learned was about the difference between fear and courage. Mm. And, you know, fear, fear in my business life didn't feel like fear in my caregiving life. Fear in my caregiving life could be paralyzed in a moment I didn't understand. Mm. Uh, In a moment, I didn't know what to do. But what I came to learn and what I share with a lot of caregivers these days is that fear is really fundamentally about a belief that something will cause pain or harm. Mm -hmm. And courage, if we can flip it around and think about courage, Courage isn't the absence of fear, it's feeling the fear, Mm -hmm. but taking the step anyway. Yeah. And that's what caregivers do every single day. Yeah. They do what they need to for their loved ones. So I developed this really simple exercise, and I used to use it in my work life, but applied it to my caregiving life. And it's a simple subconscious practice. So in a moment of fear and caregiving, because the day is usually filled with them, yep. I first ask myself, what am I afraid of right now? Not next week, next month, or the end of this journey. What am I afraid of in this moment? Mm-hmm. And then I think through if that fear is real or perceived, if it's rational or irrational, because a lot of fear around caregiving is irrational and perceived. I think I believe this about it, but it's perceived. It's not. Yeah. And then the third piece is to question what's possible. What can you do in this moment? What's mm-hmm. possible? And lastly, to reflect. When I look back on this moment, will I be proud of what I did or will I really want to do it all over? <laughs> and what this exercise is about, plain and simple, Kimberly, is We as caregivers are so attuned to the behaviors of the people we're caring about. You talked about in the early stages with your mom, trying to figure out what would work, what wouldn't work, what sets her off, what doesn't. Mm -hmm. What we fail to do is understand the patterns of behavior in ourselves. Yeah. So if we can stop and ask, what is it I'm afraid of? If we can think through, is it real? Question what's possible and then just 
add that kicker about, will I be proud of how I behaved in this moment? Mm -hmm. I can tell you there were lots of moments in my caregiving I'm not proud of. Mm -hmm. And I hope by talking to other people, I can help them see that they have a tremendous amount of courage in caregiving. Absolutely. They should be proud that they just stepped into it. (laughs) Absolutely. That they took it on first, like give yourself grace and, and a pat on the back as many times as you humanly can and know that you're doing the best that you can every single day. I am blessed to have friends that acknowledge me when, when they talk to me and ask me, how is your mom doing? You know, and I'm all, all the same, good days, bad, you know, and they always say, you're a great daughter. You know, it's just that second of thank you, you know, because you worry and fear every day. Are you doing the right thing? Could I do something else? You know, and that's what emotionally starts to drain you and know that the fact that you just stepped into that role without hesitation in itself, something you should be commended for and proud of and give yourself credit because it's a hard journey for everyone. It's a very hard journey. And and the one thing I love on the concept of courage is the symbol Native Americans use for courage. The symbol is the morning star at dawn. Mm. The reason is it's the brightest star in the sky at dawn. And who but caregivers understand how difficult those hours are. Mm -hmm. Fear, the thoughts of what if and what could. And yet every day they put them aside and go back to their caregiving journey Mm -hmm. for their loved one. So you're right. We need to stop and be grateful. Yeah. Yeah. You know, those are really kind, sweet words and thoughts to be thinking of. It will definitely get me thinking more. My middle name is Dawn. Oh, cool. Morning star at Dawn. It will be easy for me to remember. But tell folks, you know, how... They can get a hold of you if they have more questions. Absolutely. So I have a website. It's Lisa B. Cap, and Cap is with a C, C A P P. My name is a blend of my married name and my maiden name. Capaletti was my maiden name, and I shortened it to make it easier and honor my mom. Yeah. Um, so people can reach me at that email address, so Lisa at lisabcap.com. On my website at lisabcap.com. I am active on Twitter, on LinkedIn, mm-hmm. and on Facebook. And I publish regularly on my blog articles about stuff that's important to people. I also use people I talk to on a regular basis in my blogs to help tell their stories. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you so much for being a guest with me today and sharing your work and your story and and the things that you're doing to bring awareness to this horrible disease and to the caregivers that have the courage and getting out there and jumping in because it's definitely needed for sure. And Kimberly, I appreciate your work because you are introducing this in a segment of our population that's just getting introduced to it. So keep up the hard work. (laughs) (laughs) I appreciate you. I appreciate you so much. And to the listeners, if this episode and the advice from Lisa, you know someone that needs to hear it, please send them this episode, share this episode with them, maybe tag them in the comments section. And if you'd like to listen to other episodes, again, you can go to thatkimberly.com to pick which platform to choose to listen to the episodes on. And until next week, remember sharing is caring. And to all the caregivers listening in the words of my friend, Dottie Gandhi, you have my undying love, gratitude, and admiration. And to all those that have not had that tough conversation with their loved ones about what if they get dementia and they can no longer take care of themselves, then what, what's the plan? Because I wish I would have had that conversation with my mom, for sure. So thank you, Lisa, so much. Thank you, Kimberly. Have a great one. You too.